With that said, if you would, turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 John, John's first epistle, 1 John. What we're going to do is we're actually going to walk through this book, uh, this Lord's Day and next Lord's Day, uh, the book of 1 John. We'll start in chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, this book's a little easier to walk through at a faster pace because a lot of what John says is quite redundant and it's, he repeats himself a lot. So don't, don't, uh, don't, don't get a little overwhelmed looking at, oh, this is five chapters. We're going to cover like 2.5 chapters a week. You know, that's pretty fast. But like I said, we're going to be doing um, a lot. We're going to be moving quickly because he will repeat himself uh, quite often throughout the book. So chapter 1, verse 1, we'll start there. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that he would bless uh, the preaching of his word. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship with your people, uh, to preach to them your word. Father, I pray that the effect would be great upon them, that they would be instructed. I pray that I myself would, would be filled with joy uh, and a greater understanding of your truth as this sermon's preached. I pray you'd give me grace to focus upon uh, the content of this sermon, that I would have a clear mind, uh, that the enemy would be in your providence hindered from attacking me or any of my brethren. We know that he's even at work trying to distract us by the cares of this life, by the cares of the world, uh, to focus on things that are vain in light of the things that are eternal. So, Father, we ask that you would not only hold him back and, and uh, keep him from us, deliver us from uh, the evil one, but also that you, by your Spirit, would grant us the grace to, to focus and to pay attention and to understand these things. Uh, Father, and we know that your truth brings um, to us great joy and delight. And so, Father, we, uh, we rejoice even now knowing uh, that we will uh, have our joy increase and our joy made full uh, tonight as we look at your word. Father, and I likewise ask if anyone's unconverted in our midst, in our assembly, uh, we, we don't need to be foolish and assume that all are in Christ in this room. I pray that if anyone is a false professor or someone who perhaps does not even profess to know the Redeemer at all, I ask that you would save them, draw them to your Son, uh, and all, I pray you would do it all to your glory, that you would do it uh, for your namesake, for your fame, and for your renown, O oh God. We know that that's why you do all that you do in creation. As Paul mentioned, even uh, we, we looked in Philippians 1, um, that the things that Paul spoke about there were, and God, that God was doing were to his glory. And so uh, we praise you and we glorify you even now this evening and through the mediator, the only mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. The title of this sermon is True and False Conversion Part 1. True and False Conversion Part 1. That's, that's the grand theme of the book of John. It, it, the entire book is dedicated to one subject. Assurance of salvation. How do I know that I am a Christian? That I am a genuine follower of Jesus Christ? Um, we all know this, and, and I preached on this in, uh, a few weeks ago. In Matthew 7, Jesus makes it very clear at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that there are many who are going to profess him. They're going to, be, they're going to say they believe in him. But on the day of judgment, they're going to be found wanting. They're actually going to be found that their profession was empty. Their, their confession of faith was an empty confession. It meant nothing in the sight of God. For God saw their heart and saw that they had still remained unchanged. unchanged. You could say they had changed um, the outward appearance, their outward uh, extremities, but that stuff um, was an was a ill representation because inwardly they were still dead. Uh, Jesus uses the phrase of the Pharisees, whitewashed tombs. And that's exactly uh, the state of uh, someone who is a false convert. And so Jesus says these things, and we ask ourselves, and he mentions even there in chapter, in chapter 7 of Matthew, that there are trees that bear good fruit and trees that bear bad fruit. But we ask ourselves, well, what is the good fruit? What is the bad fruit? Because it's, it's, it's a generic analogy. It's not very specific as to, well, okay, if that's the case, how am I, how am I able to see what, if I'm bearing good fruit or bad fruit? Because Jesus says, whatever kind of fruit you're bearing, that's the tree. That's the kind of tree you are, to go along with the analogy. And that's whether you're, Ill, you're an illegitimate believer or not. I mean, what are the works that I have to perform, as it were? What are the works that have to be evident in my life, that, that have to be there for me to say, yes, God's done a work of grace in me? It's not that we're justified by our works, but they are the evidence of justification. They're the, they're the natural result, you could say, 
We, of course, hold, as, as is told all throughout Scripture, that salvation is by grace. But grace produces works. And that's an interesting, oh, it appears to us as a dichotomy, but it's actually not. It's very simple. You know, if you, um, we were just talking about marriage. Uh, an example is a husband who professes to love his wife, but he's renowned in town to be sleeping around with all the women in town. Well, his profession of faith, and his, or a profession of love in his wife, toward his wife, is quite illegitimate. I mean, no one believes him. Like, the guy's a phony. But if a man genuinely says to his wife, I love you, and he stands by that, and he's faithful to her, well, we can say the, the works have met what he's professed. The, the words have met his, his, or the works have met his words, you could say. They're in agreement with one another. And it's like that with a, with a professing, professing Christian uh, the, the profession of faith must be met with works. James mentions this uh, in the book of James. He, he talks about showing your faith by your works. In fact, your, faith, your works do preach. They do proclaim to the world a message. And really the message is whether you're Christ's or you're not. You're not Christ's. So. But what's amazing is in God's providence, he has caused uh, John. He has, he has enabled John through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God in his first epistle to dedicate an entire book to the one subject of true and false conversion. That's so significant. Because this is not, and you'll hear this a lot from me, because it's actually taught a lot about in the Bible, uh, this subject of true and false conversion. But you won't hear it a lot in churches. Because one, it makes everybody uncomfortable, and it's very offensive. But God mentions it a lot. And he would even cause it to be that an entire book is dedicated to its subject. I mean, you look at any other New Testament book um, and you see the contents of it. Often, like in Paul's writings, that, that there's so many different things being discussed in those books. There's so many important topics to be discussed. We look at the Gospels. We say, wow, four Gospels, four narratives of Jesus' life. Well, God, of course, you know, wants us to get that. Out of anything else, he wants us to see the glory of Christ. So he caused four books to be written. And we don't, we don't see any other major subject that's given an entire book besides true and false conversion. Other than Revelation, which is about the second coming of Christ. That's a very important topic. That's amazing that this one topic gets a book to itself. And it does. From chapter 1 all the way to chapter 5. There are other, are other things that are brought up you know, here and there. But the thrust and the, and the thesis of the book is to, to give the believers a, an assurance. He's, he's writing to the church, uh, the church he write, that he's writing to. We're not sure what, what church it was or if it was for a specific church or just believers around the area, around the world. But it was for their sake that they might determine whether or not they are Christians. Because Paul mentions this in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, or 1 Corinthians 13, excuse me, that we are to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. It's actually 2 Corinthians. Corinthians 13, excuse me. But irregardless, the, the text is there that we are, uh, one of the activities that a Christian is to practice period, periodically throughout their walk with Christ is an act of, of self-examining, looking to themselves to see whether they have been truly changed by God's grace. And for those who are truly Christ's, uh, they will see, yes, God is, is, is enabling me by his grace to perform these things. Yes, I'm bearing good fruit. Um, to go along with the analogy that's mentioned there in Matthew 7. So that's what this book is about. That's what John is writing about. And it's not, you know, like I said, this, 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 this subject is uncomfortable, but it is for our encouragement. I want you to remember that, brethren. Those of you who are truly brethren, this is for us and our encouragement. Because guess what? If you're truly Christ, when you look at these tests, because this book's really just a series of tests. When you look at them, you, you may say, well, I fail here, I, I, I definitely fall short here. But overall, generally speaking, God is doing these things in me. I, I see these things in my life. I see them in my heart. I do love God. I do love my neighbor, and they're evidenced by my works. I'm imperfect, certainly. But yes, there, there, there's evidence. There, 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 there's a pulse there. There's life. Praise God. I've changed. I wasn't like I was before. You know, there's a famous theologian. He said, I, "I know." He said, "I'm not the man that I used to. Be. I'm not the man I ought to be. Not the man I used to be. But by the grace, I, I messed it up. But basically, saying, I'm not who I want to be. Uh, I'm not. But I'm also not who I was. There, 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 there's a distinction from when um, I was lost to where I am now. Um, unfortunately, sometimes my memory does fail me. But uh, that shows that I'm finite as well, and, and uh, definitely." Uh, Imperfect, but um, 
The truth is still the same. So, And this is also, wow, such an important topic due to the area of history that we live in specifically. Um, I've mentioned this before, um, you know, in, in America specifically. We, I, I would say the vast majority of professing Christians are not Christians, point blank. And I can say that not only from just... Uh, the biblical perspective, because Jesus says that. It's, it's said in Scripture. Most people who profess to be followers of Jesus will go to destruction. Jesus mentions in Matthew 7 that about the narrow way and the broad way. Do you know who he's talking to? Remember who he was talking to? His disciples. He wasn't talking to the pagans. He's saying amongst you, amongst you there's a broad way to destruction. And only few of you will find it. And that's true because what happens later on in John 6 after Jesus says, I'm the bread of life says most of his disciples, many of his disciples, were no longer walking with him. And then we have Peter make a profession. He says, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? So, anyways, but we today live in a society of many professing Christians all around us. All around in Lawrence County. They're everywhere. And I mentioned, I've, I, I can say this from a biblical perspective, but I can also say it from an experiential perspective that on the streets... Um, I mean, Matt, I mean, uh, Mike and I, I mean, we, we encountered this on Friday. A woman came up to us and got to share the gospel with her, but she knew Christian terminology. She knew the Bible, and she said she was a Christian, but she wasn't a Christian. And she was actually self-incriminating because we, we talked with her about, you know, what is she trusting in for salvation? And she told us that she's trusting in herself. She's trusting in her righteousness. Well, you know, Jesus is exclusive and Jesus is jealous for glory and, and salvation, so he doesn't, he doesn't want people who are prideful. In fact, he says that the, only the humble, it talks about, uh, Scripture talks about you have to humble yourself before God. You have to realize that you're spiritually bankrupt and then run to the Redeemer. You can't, you can't say, well, i got some extra over here. You've got to run you know, to Christ in desperation. This woman wasn't desperate enough. So, uh, but the Lord gave us great opportunity to show her her desperation, to show her her desperate, dire straits that she was in, as it were, and to point her to Christ. Uh, and the Lord definitely, I think, gave her a, a, at least a restrained evil. And she was very receptive um, to a certain extent. So we praise God for that. But with, this is all around us. People professing to be Christians. In fact, that's what's so ironic is um, when the outside world, when the pagan world looks at America, it actually is a bad witness on Christianity. Because unfortunately, America does carry with it a, a strong... Um, Christian undertone, and we have a, a society that is quite strongly formed uh, and built upon Christian values, Christian principles. Um, and so they think, man, you know, America is one of the worst countries for pornography, one of the worst for divorce, one of the worst for drunkenness, drug abuse, sexual morality, familial dysfunctions. You think, and yet we're the most Christian nation in the world? There's a, there's a disconnect there. It is, because many who profess to be followers of Christ are not. So... And why is that? They fail these tests. They fail these tests. And one of the reasons is we have what we have today. It's like I mentioned, this isn't preached. This isn't preached. And I think you can even, as believers, scour your memory. How many times have you heard a sermon preached on 1 John? How many times have you heard a sermon preached on 1 John? That's sad. That's the Bible. This isn't like I'm bringing something new. This is just there in Scripture. And we're going to look at it together tonight. So let's do that now. Let's look at true and false conversion, beginning in verse one. Of course, he's not going to immediately open up that. He's going to give it a little, bit of a, a little bit of an introduction. It's a beautiful, one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture. Very poetic. He says, verse 1. It's very theatrical, too. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. That's his, that's his opening Remarks, like I said, it's very, very poetic, very theatrical, but very glorious because he's speaking of, of course, Jesus himself. And it's interesting, he notices, uh, I just want to note one thing, or he, he writes in verse 1 when he mentions, we touched with our hands. I mentioned this before, the apostles were those who had personal interactions with Jesus, so there's a great authority with their teaching ministry. John being one of them, one of the disciples of Jesus. 
has great apostolic authority directly from Jesus himself. And I've already pointed out that these teachings of true and false conversion directly descend from our Lord's lips. Uh, and even Old Testament scriptures talk about these things. This is, this is all throughout even the Old Testament. These things are not even new to uh, the New Covenant, the New Testament church. And notice what I said there in verse, uh, notice what I said earlier. He says the same thing in verse 4. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Brethren, it is for our joy. Do not be discouraged concerning self-examination. You ought to do it. You ought to examine yourself. You need to study. You need to scrutinize yourself under the, under the, the microscope of Scripture, you could say. Under, under, the, under the eyeglasses of Scripture and look at your life. And really, really assess, where am I in the kingdom? Am I out? Am I Christ? Am I not? Or even, yes, I'm in the kingdom. How, how far have I progressed? And, and how far do I need to go? I want to pursue maturity. We even talked about this, that this morning. And that's for our joy. That's for our joy. So remember that. Remember that these things are written to that end. In fact, in chapter 5, if you'll turn there really briefly, chapter 5, just a couple pages over. Unless you've got a study Bible, then you'll flip about 80 pages. <laughs> Man, those study Bibles are huge. I'm serious. Like, you need a permit to carry it. You can really hurt somebody with them. Um, seriously. The, especially those Reformation. Any of you League and Ear fans, the Reformation study Bible is like, it's a monster. It's a monstrous Bible. Anyways, not good for preaching. Not good for preaching at all. Too small print. But um, excellent for study. But in chapter 5, verse 13, chapter 5, verse 13, he actually, at the end of the book, um, gives, a, gives a, a concluding statement, a concluding statement about what has all been said. He summarizes it in one verse. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know what happens when a true believer examines themselves? They walk away knowing they have eternal life. So remember that. It is for our encouragement. Let's go back to chapter 1. After verse 4. Pick up in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announce to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. This is one of the themes. He's already introducing it to us. This is one of the themes that's going to play a very significant role throughout the entirety of the book. And that's a very simple concept that we all understand. And it's light and darkness, light representing holiness, purity, godliness, any God himself, we could say. Jesus is the light of the world. And we have darkness representing sin, unholiness, impurity, being lost, destruction, Satan. We have, we have the, the two polar opposites. So remember that because we're going to see this brought, about, uh, brought to our attention later on. Because And even now, he goes along with this very analogy. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. There's the first test. It's a very generic test. Very generic. Basically, what he says here, excuse me, basically what he says here is, if you profess to, to believe and to know God, yet your life is marked and the term walk doesn't indicate that you actually commit those things. Because we all as Christians sin. We all commit sin. And there's times even when we take a step into darkness. But a Christian will not walk in darkness. He won't take a, a marathon in darkness. There may be a time when he takes a stroll, we could say. But he's not going to run a marathon in it. He's not going to abide in it. And if you find that, oh, I, as I look at Scripture, I see that I'm walking and I'm practicing and I'm living and I'm delighting in doing unrighteous deeds. And I'm, I'm, I'm truly, as the text says, walking in darkness. What does he say? You lie. This is about the transgression of God's law because you've now borne false witness. And you do not practice the truth, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. So in other words, if we instead do the opposite, it's not just, oh, well, I'm a moral person. I don't do these things. I'm not as evil as this guy over here. That's not, that's not a true Christian. That, the, the true Christian doesn't just say, well, I just, you know what? I don't cheat on my wife. I drink every once in a while, but I'm not a drunkard. I'm very clean, I raise my kids well, and we go to church every once in a while. That's not a true Christian. It's not about being neutral, because guess what? The neutral man's going to go to hell too. 
And there, because there is no, what we, we know this, there is no such thing as neutrality. Really, the neutral man is just a prideful man and a self-righteous man. Rather, it's on the way other end of the spectrum. You're actually saying, I'm walking in light. I'm walking in the light of God's word. I'm in obedience to it. I'm praying. I'm studying the word of God. I'm fellowshipping with God's people. I'm sharing the gospel. I'm seeing to it that I obey him in thought, word, and deed, that he is my delight and my joy. Why? Because I feel like I have to do these things to enter into heaven? No. Because then there, that's, you're again, you're at the same spot as the moral guy. You're still a hypocrite. You're a Pharisee. It's because it's in light of the grace of God. In fact, if someone, I mean, you could put it in an analogy form to really get the concept. If someone were to, let's say you're at your house watching TV, and you hear a uh, knock on your door. There's a gentleman dressed up in a very nice, you can tell it's a multi-thousand dollar suit. You know, a very clean cut guy. And he's got a suitcase. And he says, I've been sent from, uh, we'll just say, I've been sent from President Donald Trump, because there's someone that's rich, everybody knows. And he says, for whatever reason, let's just assume it's not realistic. It's just a concept here I'm trying to introduce to you. He says, for whatever reason, he's decided he wants to give you half of his estate. So you've got multi-billions of dollars in cash at your disposal. Here's a little bit of a, a showcase, and he shows you like some cash in a briefcase, okay? And it's free of charge. It's given to you by grace, unmerited favor. Just because he cared, you know, he wanted to. What, what are you, you going to have? You're going to have a few emotions for sure, and they're going to be quite strong. But it's more than that. It's also your will. Your will has changed. You now want to what? Show gratitude toward the one who gave you that. Even show gratitude toward the one who, who brought that there. Saying, you know, thank you, thank you so much. And then, then you want to call up the president and say, thank you for doing this. Or, you know, and, and you're going to feel an obligation, but not out of slavery, out of joy for what they have done for you for the rest of your life. And he snaps your, his finger and you'll do as he pleases. Why? Because you're grateful. Because you're grateful. And it's likewise with God. We don't do it. In fact, the Bible talks about God hasn't given his people a, a spirit of fear, a spirit, a spirit of slavery leading to fear. That is a spirit of, oh, if I don't do this, you know, lightning from heaven is going to come down and strike me. Rather, we say, oh, if I were to get, be given all the riches of the world, they would not even compare to the glory of being a child of God. They would not compare to the wonder of knowing that my name is written in heaven and that one day I'll behold the face of the Son of God and worship Him forever. That He Himself died for me. So how much more, therefore, should we be compelled by gratitude and joy and gladness to give it all for Him and to, to truly die, to die to self every day for His sake? So that's the difference between... You know, man-made religion, you could say, and, and true biblical Christianity, true religion. So that's what John's mentioning here. It's not walking in the line of obligation, out of joy, rather out of joy and gratitude and gladness. What's, what's, the, what's the result of this? He says, we have fellowship. That's the middle of verse 7. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are cleansed, and we are given fellowship with those who have likewise been cleansed and who likewise walk in the truth. That's one of the themes we're also going to see and we're going to trace out, is that one of the aspects of someone who's been true, or one of the fruits of someone who's truly been born again is that they will love God's people. I can think about the, um, let's see, I was seven, I was 15, I was, I was about eight years. I was unconverted for, I was a false convert for eight years. So I thought I was a Christian for eight years during my teenage years, or half of them, and my younger, or my later uh, childhood years. False convert, engaged in sin, lived a life of unrighteousness, thought I was a believer. I even knew a lot about the Bible, probably more than a lot of other people. And um, I had even an interest, oddly, I even had an interest in evangelism as an unbeliever. All, it wasn't motivated out of love for souls or love for God. It was actually motivated out of pride. I, I, I really took, and this is, ashamed to, I'm ashamed to say it, but I took pride in being right over everyone else. And guess what? Christianity is true. And I was always right. Every time I stood on the, the side of the gospel, even though I was lost, I was right. What I was saying was true. But I, you know, you could say I took it and, and it, it, it was something that puffed me up. Rather, uh, now I could say the intent is really I, I, I don't want people to go to destruction. And I love people. And I'm bound. I'm the slave of Christ and his glory. I want to proclaim to the world and bring him glory. Um, and may my name perish along with me um, as I do so. But... With that said, going back to my, my B.C., I like to always say before I was converted, B.C., before Christ. 
Um, so when I'm saying that, I'm not talking about the years prior to Jesus' actual birth. Typically, I'm meaning me before I was a believer. So BC, Lucas, was, you know, was one of the things that marked my life as a false convert was I did not care about going to church. And um, I didn't want to go to church, and a lot of times I didn't go to church. And it wasn't, um, certainly an aspect was I didn't care much about preaching or even what the Bible really taught, even though I knew a good amount more than others. It was actually because I really didn't care about fellowshipping with God's people. And that's one of the things that really brought me joy after I was converted and made me realize, yes, God's actually done something in me because he implanted within me a great love for his people. And it's, it, it grows out of a love for God. It grows out of a love for God because when we see his people, guess what we see in God's people? The image of God restored. We see these people, are they remind me of the most beautiful one to me, and that's God. They remind me of the glorious Christ. They remind me of my Redeemer, so I want to be around them. And um, I remember right when I was um, first converted, it was like it was always a, day, a weekly delight to go to church because I wanted to be with God's people. So, and we'll see that traced out. Uh, we'll see that brought, about, uh, brought to our attention later on. About love for God's people. That's such, a, such an evidence. But going along with that, you know what we find again in our, in our day and age, and I just love to bring these things back to the now, to, 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 to our day, and to America specifically, just where we live. So that's why I mention America a lot, it's just because we live here. If we lived in Guatemala, I'd say Guatemala. But this is where we live, this is where we're at, this is the culture we're in. And the Bible, the truth of the Bible, addresses these things that we deal with on a day to day basis. You know, I find a lot of times on the streets is you hear from people all the time, and you've heard this, you've all heard this, I'm sure. I love Jesus. I'm not a big fan of going to church. I'm a Christian, but church is just, it's not really my thing. And there are, there are legitimate cases when people, they've been hurt, there are, and they've had a bad taste left in their mouth from a church. Or, and there is, there is an aspect of compassion there, because um, a lot of people have been through things that I haven't been through with church, so I can't imagine there is pain but for, the, for a general truth, though, and generally speaking, are these people saying that because, you know, they were hurt or because of this or that or the pastor said something that offended them? No, actually, it's probably because they don't love God's people. They just don't. In their mind, an unbeliever and a believer, they have about the same fellowship with them. But I'll tell you this. I've, I've had a unique fellowship with you all and with all Christians I've ever met and something I cannot ever have with an unbeliever. And I have, I have friends who are unbelievers. I have family members who are unbelievers, and I love to time, spend time with them. But I cannot have what I, with them what I have with you all, and will never if they are if they remain outside of Christ. Because you and I, you and I, have been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We walk in the light. We we are under Christ's lordship. They are as well, but they don't submit to it. They're you know they are rather slaves to their sins. So we see that all around us. People claiming to be Christians, but they don't care anything about going to church. It's the weirdest thing. And I'm thinking, that's one of the greatest evidences against them. That's self-incriminating. That's, 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 that's admitting guilt, basically saying, I mean, that's like saying, I mean, imagine this. Okay, the church is what? What does the Bible say? The church is Jesus' what? Bride. Bride. And it talks about his love for her. It even talks about when we are in heaven, there's going to be a marriage supper. It's amazing. It's amazing. Jesus loves his church. Imagine... We'll, we'll use Mike in his example here. Imagine a guy came to Mike and he said, or he, he came, was talking to me about Mike. He said, listen, I love Mike, but man, Michelle gets on my nerves. <laughs> and Mike heard that. Now, do you think what Mike would be a little offended? Probably. Probably. And rightly so. That's his wife. If you like Mike, guess who you get with that? Michelle. They're a unit because Scripture talks about man wiping one flesh. How much more Christ with his church? I mean, imagine, imagine what an offense that is to God to really say that. Oh, I like God. Jesus is great. But Christians, they just get on my nerves. They're just a lot of hypocrites. That's sad. That's grievous. And it's greatly offensive to the Lord Jesus. So anyways, continuing. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now this, this is a direct hit to, um, and I'll be very quick with explaining this because I don't want to get too caught up in it. In, in the day and age, this is, this is toward... Um, the 80s and the 90s uh, in the first century. So this is way late. This is about the end of the apostolic age. This book was written, one of the oldest, uh, or excuse me, one of the latest um, written New Testament epistles. One of the movements that started to arise in the New Testament church, well, not in the church, but around the church, was a movement called Gnosticism. 
And basically what the Gnostics believed, they believed a lot of heretical things. They believed a lot of wacky ideas. One of them was that uh, you could be sinless. You could, you could attain to sinless perfection. So John addresses that, that false belief that's starting to be circulated amongst uh, Christian circles, we could say. Not amongst real genuine Christians, but people who are false Christians and who are starting to, to believe these false doctrines. Basically saying, we have no sin. In fact, Mike, even, I keep using, bringing you up, Mike, but you mentioned uh, we were talking on Friday and Mike was telling me about a time he actually encountered a guy who said he hadn't sinned since the late 70s, 78, if I remember correctly. <laughs> And we were just talking about, this man is so utterly blind, because I don't know about you, but I look at me and I'm kind of scared. I'm horrified at myself. My, my capability, even as a Christian, to sin is scary. I am, I'm prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And my heart, as Scripture talks about, the heart being deceitful. And, uh, and I can testify, and I know you can as well. John Calvin said, the heart is a factory of idols, always in production, 24-7, and it doesn't close down. And that's exactly true. Um, so this gentleman who claimed sinless perfection was so ignorant of his own heart. Uh, and John goes so far as to say, if you say you have no sin, you say, and even if you say, well, I once was sinful, but now I've attained to a level of Christian maturity. This is even in some denominations, these kind of doctrines are taught, taught, taught. Basically, oh yeah, you can get to a point. You can have this experience where you're now cleansed of all actual sin in your life. He says, if you say that, we are deceiving ourselves in verse 8, and the truth is not in us. You can bank on it. If you're so prideful as to say that you have no sin right now, you are deceiving yourself. The Puritans even said, our tears of repentance need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's so true. Even our, even our prayers, even our worship needs to be sanctified by our Lord. Why do you think Jesus is always making intercession for you and I? Because our prayers are so filthy. Our prayers are so utterly imperfect that they would not be acceptable to God had, it, had Christ not been our intercessor. And he is always, Scripture says, making intercession for us right now. It's amazing. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's another test. The true Christian is about what? Confessing sin. Because what's now at work in the life of the Christian that, wasn't, that isn't in the, in, at work in the life of the unbeliever? The Holy Spirit. And he's convicting. He's reminding us of sin. So there's, there's, a, there's a fruit right there. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's basically saying the same thing he said in verse 8. One of the things we'll find, I mentioned John repeats himself. One of the reasons being John was Jewish. In Jewish uh, literature, if you wanted to stress a point, you'd repeat yourself. Um, and even though he was writing this in Greek, a lot of Hebraic writings um, and even Greek writings written by Jews were written in this way um, to, to really emphasize a point. That's why I said a lot of this will we'll hopefully make our way through quickly. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Remember, no chapter breaks. He continues... My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Also, these things are to keep us from more sin. And to, 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 to enable us, by God's grace, to walk in greater heights of uh, maturity and, and keeping away from sin. He says, if, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. That is uh, the parakletos, the one who's called alongside to help. And who is that? It's Jesus Christ the righteous. Verse, chapter two, or excuse me, verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. In verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. That's very similar to walking in the light, but John wants to further uh, delineate and, and explain what, what is it actually walking in the light. Well, it's obeying God's commandments. Um, this morning I had the pleasure of listening to um, some teaching in, in Travis's class. On, uh, on the law of God. And it was such a delight. It brought me joy to think, wow, God's law is so precious and so great and so just. You know, Psalm 119, you know, you read about the psalmist praising God for his law and delighting in the law of the Lord. And that's the heart of the Christian. That's our delight. That's a mark of being truly converted. That it, the law of God is, lo is, is looked upon by the Christian as something that is great and wonderful. And it's our delight to walk in accordance with it and to honor it because we seek to honor the God who inspired its writing. 
Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. That's so interesting. So, in fact, the very word Christian, you know what it means? It means little Christ. Little Christ. We know the term Christian was actually a derogatory term. We see it in the book of Acts. It was, it was given to the followers. In fact, before then they were called followers of the way. The way. Um, and after that, they got the derogatory term for little Christ. Because again, I mentioned this this morning, Jesus was not, you know, even in pagan society today, there's even a respect for Jesus and his teachings. And people say, yeah, he's a pretty good teacher. No, not in those days. It was a reproach. He was, a, he was an enemy of the state. He was seen as a, as a rebellious um, a rebellious leader who was trying to really cause a Jewish uprising and set up another Jewish kingdom and destroy Roman sovereignty. He was seen like a domestic terrorist, we could say. I mean, he was not someone who was praised even amongst the pagans, certainly not. And so then the pagan world takes notice of Jesus' followers after his death, in the wake of his death, and the great number of people that come to him and, and believe in him and follow his teachings. And so they think, oh, these little Christs. It's a derogatory term. So likewise today, though, that term still sticks. We use it all the time. We're Christians. We're believers in the Christ. And therefore, we ought to be little Christs. When people look at us, they ought to really see a little Christ. A follower of the capital Christ, capital C Christ, the Lord of glory. And they ought to see that we are walking in the same manner, the modus operandi that he himself walked in. Chapter, uh, verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is a word which you have heard. This is not new. This isn't something that John came up with. Even Jesus. This is Old Testament truth. This is, this is so basic. This has been around since the very beginning of creation. In fact, all the way back to God's promises to Abraham, we find these ideas, these concepts of a true, uh, a true believer and a false uh, believer. In fact, um, God talks about Abraham's descendants, his physical descendants, uh, and we know that's that's later explained in the New Testament. Um, and Paul uses the phrase like this. He says, "Not all Israel uh, are Israel. Not who, are, not all who descend from." Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that line that God chose, are actually true Israelites. You know, we're the true Israelites. We're actually the true Israel of God. We're the true people of God. Um, you could be Jewish and reject the Lord Jesus Christ, and your Judaism is forfeited. Your, 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 um, your, your perceived uh, Israelite status is, is voided. It's meaningless. But you can be a follower of Christ and be Jewish, certainly. And likewise, you be Gentile. We, we see it very clearly happen in the New Testament that um, the Gentile believer is more Jewish than the Jewish non-believer. That makes sense. Verse 8, yet he says what? On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. That's true for us as Christians, and that, that's an interesting concept I'll just make a slight note on, a small note on, is um, we, we do have varying opinions about eschatology. I know some Christians believe that in, in, in a pre-tribulation rapture, they believe Jesus is you know, going to be a, a horn sounded, the trumpet sounded, excuse me, and the believers going to be taken out in seven years of tribulation, and then Jesus will finally return. Other Christians I know, very well-respected, godly people believe in What's called amillennialism. Jesus is now on, on his throne, in, in, uh, reigning as king, and all things are continuing to get worse, but one day he's just going to return, and that's that. I also know there's some godly people who believe in post, uh, or excuse me, uh, yeah, post millennialism, which is that everything's actually going to continue to get better and better and better until Jesus actually comes down and sets up his kingdom on earth, his second coming. So, different opinions. And um, however, we all can say this with the apostle, the darkness is passing away and the light is shining. The gospel is a triumphant gospel. Jesus' kingdom is triumphant. Regardless of what position you have in the end times, we know this. 
Christ is king, Christ is Lord, Christ rules, his kingdom's ever expanding, and he's doing it by his power. And the darkness is, in terms of, in terms of um, we have to step back and get a grand view of history, not just our moment, because again, in our moment it seems like, especially in our culture, things are going down, but talking about a grand view of history. Yes, there is light. And the true light is shining all the more, as it were, and the darkness is being dispelled and being cast down, being overcome. In fact, the term that John writes or uses in John 1, the, the Gospel of John, he says, um, the, um, the darkness cannot comprehend the light. And in fact, the, the word there can also be translated overcome. Overcome. The darkness cannot overcome the, the power of the Lord Jesus' gospel. Anyways, verse 9, the one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So there it is. Love for God's people is so clear. And if it's not there, you're, you're blinded. You're, 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 you're not in Christ. And you abide in death. Verse 12, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I've written to you children because you know the father. I've written to you fathers because you have known him who was from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, verse 15, and the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. This is one of my favorite verses. I remember when I was first converted, I memorized this verse and I was like, that's so awesome. <laughs> I was like, this is such a great verse. I mean, I because again, these things are not taught. I never heard this preached. I didn't even know this existed in the Bible, this concept of true and false conversion. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. If you love the world, if you're a worldling, that's one a term that Arthur Pink, famous Reformed um, teacher, used. Worldling, L-I-N-G, worldling, just to describe unbelievers. They're of the world. They live in the world. They love the world. They love the things of the world. They love to talk, to think, to act, to behave, to dress like the world. If you're like that, God's love's not in you. Because you don't even you don't understand God. You're blinded. You, you, your mind is corrupted by sin. And that's true. Anyone who seeks to be worldly. That's why these churches, we look around us, we look at these mega churches. We look at these, um, these large ministries and they're seeking to be uh, friendly to the unbelieving world. And to present and conduct church in such a way that it's easier for an unbeliever, it's more relaxed. Are we to do that? No. No. And guess what they're doing? They're breaking this. They're, they're going against this teaching. They're trying to be like the world. And in that, they're showing that they love the world. Rather, we ought not to care less. We should, or we, we should, uh, I should say, we ought to, uh, we ought not care less. Excuse me, double negative. Um, about these things that the world is doing. About the latest trend. It's all going to continue to go up and down, up and down. The world's so wildly inconsistent. If we were to try to keep up, our church would be wacky. It would just be all the time changing. Uh, rather, we are just really concerned ourselves with the Bible and being in accordance with the teaching of the Bible. So that's an evidence of false conversion. In verse 17, why is that? The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And you know what the opposite of that is? If the world is passing away in its lust, the one who loves that world is also passing away. They're, 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 they're also dead because they're loving a dying world. You know, we use the term a lot of times and we, we use terms like this and we forget their meaning. We always say a lost and dying world. It's lost because it doesn't know God and it's dying. It's denigrating. It's decaying. Those who love it are showing that they love death. Um, the, I love that proverb. In Proverbs it says, um, when wisdom, there's a, I think it's a Proverbs 8, wisdom is personified. And it's, um, it's actually written from the perspective of wisdom being a person. We know Jesus is wisdom personified. It's actually a foreshadowing of Jesus. But wisdom there says, at the end of that chapter, it says, all who hate me love death. All who hate Jesus love death. That's so true. And they love a dying culture. They love a dying world. Verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have appeared from this. We know that it is the last hour. Did you know it's something interesting? Someone who claims to be a follower of Christ, but's not, they're actually an Antichrist. They're a little, uh, 
uh, lowercase a, antichrists. There are many antichrists. There are many. Um, we know that there's coming, there's going to be one specific antichrist, capital A, but there is many, uh, lowercase a. Anyone who is, in fact, anyone who's against Christ is an antichrist. That's what the word means, anti against Christ. Um, in fact, our Reformed Baptists uh, in the London Baptist Confession identify, um, they talk about the Pope of Rome as being antichrist. Uh, as being the very essence of Antichrist. And, G and that's a good example of, of an Antichrist. Po the Pope is an Antichrist because he claims to be the head of the church and Jesus says, that's my role. That's exclusive to me. I'm the head of the church in Scripture. So we have a man who's trying to set himself up on the same level plane with our Lord. And of course, he won't have that. In verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. If you like to highlight or you like to mark things, this is an amazing verse to mark. It's actually a good encouragement. They have, we have a statistic in evangelical circles called the fall-away rate. You've heard of it. Young children and teenagers are raised in church. There's a huge, I think it's like 80 to 90%, I've heard different estimates, when they have the opportunity, especially in their college years, to leave the fellowship, they choose to leave and to not come back. And a lot of times, they go further and totally apostatize, leave the faith. And you know what's unfortunate? I remember, right after I was converted, I had some family members tell me about a girl whom I knew and I grew up with. She was a little older than me, probably three or four years older than me, but she was friends with one of my sisters and... She had claimed to be a Christian. In fact, she even, from what I understand, she had displayed some reasonably convincing fruit of being a Christian even. And, uh, but the moment she had the opportunity, well, I'm going to say the moment, but apparently in her teenage years, she began to get on the internet and discover some different concepts about different worldviews. And the devil really deceived her, and she, she actually... The moment she got the opportunity to go away to college, she did and totally apostatized from the faith and um, basically even went so far as to say, uh, if I, I want to get pregnant just so I can have abortions. And just very wicked, very, very evil. But you know, I had, a, I had the family member that came to me and said that, said that when we found out about her going this direction, they said, well, I think she's just fallen away from the Lord. It's very rare that that would ever be the case. Especially for murder, because abortion's murder. Especially to go so far as to say, you know, God's people can fall into grievous sin. We see it in David, we saw it in Paul, uh, Peter. God's people can fall into grievous sin. And even for a period, even to such an extent that they may even say, I've been in this for quite a while, I feel like I might actually be lost. But they'll always return back. And this girl, even that was four and a half years ago, not that, four and a few months, she's still apostatized. So... What really happened, probably, is she went out from us and she wasn't of us. And same thing with that fall away rate. You know what most of those children are? And not children now, adults, when they have the right to choose to leave the fellowship, they did not leave because of other issues. They left because they themselves were not of us. And we have to address them as that. So many Christians and even a lot of grandparents and parents look at their, their, their aberrant children. They're rebellious children, and they do look at them like, and they have the tendency to do this, parents do. And I can imagine when, I have a parent, when I'm a parent, I'll have the same tendency, the same sinful tendency to overlook the blemishes of my children and to give them the benefit of the doubt. But let's not do that. Let's not be so dangerous. Let's wound them with the truth rather than comfort them with lies. Let's wound them with the truth. And the truth is coming to them and saying, you went out from us, and I believe it's because you weren't of us. So, that's something that ought to be for your encouragement. Maybe that's happened to even in this church for, as an extent. I don't know, you know the history of this church or if there was you know, younger people and they left. and I don't know where they're at, but that could be, you could have seen that. that could be an example, there could be an example of that in this church in the past. I know it's happened in a lot of churches. Young children, again, raised up. And it's not, it really, it's not the issue of that they were raised incorrectly. A lot of times they were given good Bible teaching. They just themselves were never truly converted. And what they need now is to be addressed as unbelievers and say, you need to come to Christ and be saved. And he'll save you. So, anyone who says they follow Jesus and they follow for a little while and then they leave, not to come back, it's because they never were his. Jesus even mentions this in the parable of the sower and the soils. 
chapter 20. But look, in contrast to that, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. God's a, God has given us an anointing. Who's that? That's the Spirit. He's going to keep us. We, we don't have to fear that we're going to fall away because we're His. And you all know, I've not read it and written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because there is no lie, no, and because no lie is of the truth. Verse 22, who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. That's interesting, just a note. If you reject Christ, who do you also reject? The Father and the Spirit. You reject the triune God. Verse 23, whoever denies the Son and does not, have, does not have the Father, the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. So, another evidence of a genuine Christian is what? The Holy Spirit's actually teaching the Christian, giving us understanding. There's even an aspect in which if someone, someone doesn't have an interest in studying the Bible and doesn't have a hunger and a longing to understand it, spirit cannot be in them. I'm not saying it's not ever has to be a scholar or a Bible expert, but there's got to be, and for different believers, it's at different capacities. All these things, remember this, all these evidences, it, they will look different in each person. And they will have different manifestations in different persons. I mean, there's been Christians who have been illiterate and they couldn't read the Bible. So why would, we wouldn't expect them to be, you know, at their home, at their desk, you know, writing Greek, would we? You know, we wouldn't. But they're going to have a longing. In fact, maybe the way that they satisfy that longing is to be under the preaching of the Word as much as they can. As much as they can, because they realize that's, that's how they're able to hear uh, and, and be instructed. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's in them. He's teaching them through that. Verse 28, now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. And we'll stop right there. I think that's a good note to stop on. So tomorrow, next week, I guess we got a little bit more to work on, a little bit more to go through. I was hoping to make it to about halfway through chapter 3, but that's okay. It's all providential. It's all providential. It's, and I've told you this before, it, it, the nature of Scripture is that way. Uh, even when I prepare notes and think about things I want to say, I get up here and 20 more things come to mind. And I have to just pick what I want to say. And there's a lot of things I have to just disregard, which is so unfortunate, but I guess I can say it next time. Um, it is all providential. We can trust in that. So, my exhortation, brethren, be encouraged, be filled with joy, and examine yourself in light of these things. Ask yourself, you know what? Is this, is this true of me? Is this true of me? If you're Christ, you'll be filled with joy. You'll see, yes, yes. And it will induce you to praise God because those are, those are, those are actual, tangible evidences. It's not just, well, I kind of feel like a Christian. I, just, I feel, you know. This isn't about feeling. Our faith is not based on feeling. In fact, I'd say there are many people who feel like they're Christians and they're not. And guess what? There's a lot of people who are Christians. They don't feel like they're Christians. In fact, this ought to be an encouragement if you're struggling with assurance. If assurance has been a struggle for you, this ought to be an encouragement because your assurance isn't based off of your day-to-day -day feelings or your day-to-day -day inclinations or whether you're up or down. And some of us, um, you know, like I mentioned, I'm not the biggest fan of fall. And at the fall, I typically have just a tendency, I think it has to do with the lack of the less sunlight to be a little more down. I'm not, not saying like I get depressed in the winter or anything like that or laying in bed, but just that it's, it's easier for me to get down. Whereas in the summer, more sunlight. And you know why that is? It's actually a chemical, there's a chemical aspect to that. You know, your body likes more sunlight um, and it induces uh, greater emotions. So, but if I were to gauge my Christianity, man, in those winter months, it's going to be hard for me to feel, to feel confident in the fact that God saved me. Because there may be days when I'm, you know, it was a really short day. I feel like I didn't wasn't you know I didn't see the sun a lot. Man, it's like a little bit more down. Man, I don't feel I don't really feel like a Christian. Oh man, I'm lost. You know, it's like, that's that's not the basis. The basis is what the the abiding fruit that God has been producing in my life, the actual deeds of righteousness that I've been doing by God's grace. That that's that's the abiding fruit. So be encouraged, brethren, um, and delight yourself in the Lord in light of these things, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Also, an exhortation. 
If you examine yourself, you see that you're lost. Um, it's not the end of the world in the sense of you're alive. Air in your lungs, your heart's beating. Run to the Redeemer. He'll save you from hypocrisy. Jesus is in the business of saving hypocrites, and I'm an example of that. We praise Him for that. So that's what we've seen here in First John chapters 1 and 2. I didn't, like I said, no, we didn't get, to through, get through all that we could um, or what I wanted to. But we've seen true and false conversion. The evidence is of both. And my um, hope is that these things will bless you and ultimately point you to the Christ who did come into the world to save sinners, who died, who rose again, who is seated at the right hand and who, of the Father and who does make intercession for us. That's our hope, that there's a, an intercessor who stands between God and man, who bridges the gap so that we can have supreme confidence to enter into his presence with joy and gladness, knowing that he will receive us for Christ's sake. To him be glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for your son. Oh, Father, how I pray that they're a blessing to each of us and that we would be diligent to examine ourselves, not only today, but throughout our lives as Christians to see whether we are in the faith and to, in that, see your work in our lives as believers and to be joyful because of that and to rejoice in you. I pray for those who have um, heard this who are unconverted, if any, save them for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.